Hello everyone, hope you're having a great day and welcome to the last video for chapter two here. So we talked about chromosome structure and organization and we talked about mitosis and now we're gonna talk about sexual reproduction and meiosis. Uh, so I will post another video after this one going over example problem, which you know summarizes the, this chapter pretty, pretty well. But this is the last lecture video for this unit. Okay, so sexual reproduction and meiosis. Almost forgot to make my camera smaller there. Uh, so this, remember, is when we take you know half the DNA to offspring. So how do we get half your DNA to your offspring? As you know, you if you have children or in you know anything about heredity, the offspring look like the parents, but they're not exact copies of the parents. There's some variations in those genetics. So what happens here? Just you know a quick and dirty summary. So here, remember, we have the germ cells. Germ cells begin as 2N. Those are diploid, remember. So let's say we have you know, the father and then we have the mother over here. So they're just drawing these symbols as reminders of father and mother because in genetics we use these a lot, especially when we talk about heredity. Um, but sometimes you might see different colored chromosomes. So either you know blue or pink and that also designates uh, father and mother. Uh, so then these cells go through meiosis. Remember meiosis then results in haploid daughter cells. So meiosis is broken up into meiosis one and meiosis two. So we're gonna be talking about meiosis one and two and how we go from 2N to N. So these are called gametes. So these gametes then can go through fertilization. This is a random event. Um, so which gamete is chosen is a random event. Uh, so this fertilization event then produces 2N cells again and then that can then grow into an in, into an individual so just you know quick reminder of the process here so today's focus is how do we make those gametes Oops, i forgot an e <laughs> you know this it is weird writing with this and writing the words bigger sometimes i um forget random letters in my words. Okay, so meiosis, the definition of meiosis here. So this is sexual division makes haploid cells. So making haploid cells via sexual division. So again, this is broken up into meiosis one versus meiosis two. And all this, it's pretty much different variations of mitosis. It's just some slightly different events happen in each, and it comes down to terminology and understanding the terminology things we've talked about in the first lecture and in part one of chapter two will help you right here. So meiosis one, homologs separate. Remember what homologs are. They are, you know, you have a pair of, you know, have your uh, chromosome one, you have one from your father, and then you have one from your mother. So these are homologs or homologous pairs. Um, so meiosis one, you get homologs are separated. So these separate, and then you form two haploid daughter cells. So you form two haploid cells at the end of meiosis one. So you already have a haploid cell at the end of meiosis one, but the sister chromatids are not separated yet. So you have to go through another stage of meiosis. So then you go up here to meiosis two, where sister chromatids separate. So this is pretty much the same as mitosis. Remember, mitosis is where you have a sister chromatid for cell division, and then these separate from each other. So meiosis one is separating homologous pairs, and then meiosis two is separating sister chromatids. And after this, we have two haploid cells that then go through meiosis. So after this, we have four daughter cells. Again, all are still haploid as well, too, because this is one chromosome, these then split into separate cells, which are each then one chromosome. All right, let's go over these in a little bit more detail So, because some really cool events happen in meiosis one. So meiosis one, when we talk about meiosis, we add a Roman numeral depending on which one it's in, meiosis one or meiosis two. So if I say metaphase one, you know it's metaphase one of meiosis one. If I say metaphase, I'm talking about mitosis. If I say metaphase two, I'm talking about meiosis. So make sure if you're referring to a stage in meiosis, you include the Roman numeral. So very important, especially if, you ever, if you're ever in a situation where you're taking an exam on this stuff. Okay, so the, the coolest stage of meiosis one is prophase one. This is where we have this event called synapsis and crossing over. 
Oops. Me. Right crossing, correct? So crossing over. A very, very important event that increases genetic diversity in the offspring. So here, let's say we have, you know, the mother and the father here. So these are homo homologs or homologous pairs. Let's say this is chromosome one here. So what happens is these actually line up on top of each other. The image isn't, isn't showing them on top of each other, but they actually line up over each other. And these arms, the chromosomes can then exchange with each other. So where they cross over here, so it forms like an X that's called the chiasma. So the chiasma is the location of crossing over. When they all line up over each other, that's called a tetrad or bivalent. So you might hear that term come up a few times. Now, some proteins are involved here. Later this semester, we'll get into the actual mechanisms of this or how they think it works. Uh, but this is all called the synaptonemal complex. I won't write that out. We're not going to get into too much detail on it, but it's the synaptonemal complex when this occurs. Now, one, one to three crossover events can occur per chromosome. So let's say a crossover event did occur between these two, and let's turn this pink one to red. So we would have, you know, red arm coming up, red arm coming up, down, and then down here, it won't be completely red. And this one would be exchanged with that blue region right here. And then the other chromosome, which would be the blue one, I know my blue doesn't exactly match, this arm, oops, this arm would now have that little piece of red. So now, so this is what you would get from your grand, or your parents, you would now have a mixture of genetic information from your parents. Now let's say there was a gene located on that region. So say a big A and a little A, now you just created some you know, genetic differences in the possible gametes that could form from this. Uh, so very, very interesting. This crossing over event is very cool and in, it initiates a lot of ver variety in offspring. That's really, really important for evolution because you don't want every single offspring to be genetically exactly the same. You want that variation in offspring for success in terms of evolution. Now, prophase one is also broken up into these different phases here. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on them, but you can break them down into the different stages of this crossing over event. So they're called the leptotene, the zygotene, the pachychene, the diplotene, and diakinesis. Um, so it just depends on what you can see during which part of the event. So there it says the synaptonemal complex forms and crossing over and begins at the pachytene. Um, so now let's go to metaphase uh, one. So metaphase one, we have that crossing over event that occurred. This is where we have an event called independent assortment, which also increases genetic, you know, statistics of variations in offsprings. So I have this uh, figure right here that shows how either, if we look at this closely, so we have, you know, um, we have a pair here. Here, a crossing over event occurred. Green exchange with pink. Pink goes to the left. Green goes to the right. On um, the other, you know, possibility here, you know, pink goes to the left. Green goes to the right. So same thing happens. But down here, the blue is going to the left. The pink is going to the right. On this other option here, that could e has an equal chance. Uh, pink is now going to the left, and blue is going to the right. So they're going to in different cells. So then you don't. You then you have pink with blue in this final cell. But over here you have uh, well, light pink with bright pink. So you have a different combination. That's independent assortment. So random combinations of things could happen. So each are equally likely. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later today and the actual likelihood of different combinations you can have based on your haploid number. Uh, but we'll get to that later. All right, so next up here is anaphase one. So anaphase one are when the homologs separate. So this goes back to things we talked about last chapter. So we talked about the um, cohesins. I know these aren't all in English here. It's just a nice royalty-free image I found. So remember, these proteins here are called cohesins. So if we go back to, um, I meant to say mitosis, um, co cohesins. So if we go back to mitosis and anaphase and metaphase, we had to clip these cohesins using separase in order to separate the cells. So something, cohesins are still involved here. So remember, in 
meiosis one, we want to separate the homologs, the homologous pairs. We don't want to separate the sister chromatids. So we don't cleave these ones here. Let me change the color. So these ones here stay intact, but we want to cleave the ones that are holding the homologous pairs together. So separase comes in and cleaves these ones to allow the separation of homologous pairs, but retains the ones that are wrapped around the sister chromatids. They're protected by something called um, shugosin. So shugosin protects the sister chromatids. So separase is here, but only cleaves the ones that are holding the homologous pairs together. So at anaphase one, the homologous pairs can then go to opposite sides, but the sister chromatids here remain intact. So a really, really cool event there. Um, I think that's really neat how that works. And after anaphase one, the Sugarson complex breaks down. And then when we get separase come back in anaphase two, it then can cleave between the sister chromatids. So really, really neat how that works. So then uh, separates, boom, everything's fine. Then so after meiosis one, again, remember we have, um, oops, two, haploid cells. So at this state, each cell, if we're just drawing the one right here, would have one of each. But it doesn't need to go through DNA replication again here, of course, because it already has that sister chromatid. So depending on, you know, male, female, what stage it's in, you know, between sperm and eggs, um, it can then go directly into meiosis two now. Now, some stall at different stages of meiosis too, as well. So now the goal is to separate these sister chromatids, which is the same as mitosis. Uh, so go back to the previous lecture to go over mitosis again, if you want to review that. So prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, and telophase and cytokinesis. We then get four daughter cells that have genetic differences in each of them. So here, uh, oh, there's a note in anaphase two here. I mentioned that earlier, uh, but here's where that sugarsin is degraded. So then the cohesins can then cleave the ones between the sister chromatids. So the sister chromatids can then separate. So result of meiosis again are four haploid cells different from the plant parent. Different from parents. So if we look at this, you know, we replicate the DNA, we form the homologous pairs, they line up over each other, they then can have a crossing over event, the crossing over, so there, boom, this is, so this would be prophase one, and then we go finish, you know, that stage, so then this is the finishing of uh, meiosis one, so then we go through meiosis two, and then we get the different variations in the offspring. So here you can see the possible combinations. So this one has a little bit of you know pink on its upper arm, and this one doesn't. So depending on which one of these is selected for fertilization, you're going to have different variation in the offspring. And that's all statistics and how things change with time. So just wanted to talk about that quick, and that's a nice little dirty summary of it all. And I've been hitting at this part a little bit throughout. So the sources of genetic variation and genetic recombination. So this crossing over event in prophase one is very important. Uh, so that's the main, so there are three main sources of genetic variation. First one is that crossing over event. Like I said, one to three, one to three crossover events can occur per chromosome pair. And, you know, humans have 23 pairs. Um, so Quite a lot of variation just in that event. So here, if we're looking at this, just I just want to define a few things. Let's say I'll draw this out a little better. So there's, you know, it duplicated each arm. And then this one is a recessive A. And then we have a dominant B down here. So these ones go through a crossing over event on this lower arm. And this is just showing a little example. So now, so the parents were either A, B, or well, either one of these forms. So these are the parent chromosomes. But let's look at then what the offspring are. Now we have an A, B. So that one looks like a parent. We have a big A and a big B. No parent had that combination. So this is called a recombinant. So a recombinant recombined. This first one here, even though this is labeled as recombinants, this one is called a non recombinant. So non-recombinant looks like the parent. A recombinant does not look like the parent. So little a 
little b is also recombinant. A uh, little a big B is a non recombinant. So typically NR is what I use for non recombinant. So I just wanted to mention a little bit of the definitions there between recombinants and non recombinants. All right, next way you can have a source of genetic variation here is that independent assortment in metaphase um, and anaphase one. You don't decide what goes left and what goes right. It's completely random. So we can actually calculate the number of possible combinations depending on the haploid number. So the number of gametes, or the number of possible combinations, is equal to two to the n. So this is the first time we look at math and genetics, and thankfully it's a simple equation where n is equal to the haploid number. So here we have the haploid number. Let's do a generic one where n is equal to three. So, you know, I don't think, so this one's uh, just showing, so this one here, is showing n is equal to 2. So diploid here, 4, going from 4 chromosomes to 2, the 2 to the 2 is equal to 4 different combinations. That's why it's showing 4 different cells here. Um, so, But let's do an example then. Let's say n is equal to 3, like I already wrote down here. So here we'd have 2 to the 3, which is equal 8 different gamete combinations. So then if you, you think 2 to the 23, that's a large number, and that's what humans would be. Um, I don't have a calculator in front of me right now to do that real quick for you. I should have done it beforehand. But you could type it in real fast to show it. And then the last thing um, is random fertilization. Let's say we have you know, eight combinations for the male and the female. So you don't choose which one of those eight are fertilized from either the female or the male. It's a completely random fertilization event, and that also increases genetic diversity as well. So I think I remember reading once the chances of having two identical children that aren't identical twins at the same time, of course, but separate times is like one in a trillion. So when you combine the two to the 23, the crossing over events, and then also random fertilization, the odds are quite low. <laughs> so then... Now, a little bit about some uh, terminology for meiosis in animals. Remember, uh, meiosis in animals makes the gametes. So the making of the gametes is called gametogenesis. So the gametes in the male are called the spermatozoa. And in the female are called the ova. And then gametogenesis is called spermatogenesis in the males. And oogenesis in females. Now the location for the males, or the gonads, are the testes, and females are the ovary. So just a little bit of terminology there, and these will be coming back up probably a little bit later when we're talking about the different stages where different things happen between males and females when it comes to meiosis. Uh, so like females arrest in a certain stage and they sit there for a while. Males are constantly producing sperm all their life. Females are born with you know, all, all the eggs they have, as what we know so far. Um, also, I've, I've mentioned all this time is that we produce four haploid cells. Females, however, only produce one haploid cell. So they only go from one to one. And that's because um, they create these things called polar bodies. So the female egg cell is the largest mammalian cell in humans. And it's because it takes up all the nutrients and cytoplasm from the other cell it produces. So after the first round of meiosis here, two cells are produced, but one of the cells takes all the nutrients from the other. And then that happens again here in meiosis two. So then these are all polar bodies and these end up degrading. Then this cell then becomes extra large by containing the nutrients from, well, this cell and this cell. Uh, usually this round of replication doesn't occur here. Sometimes it can, though. So yeah, just wanted to mention that slight difference uh, between um, spermatogenesis and, and oogenesis. And also, we don't talk about plants too much, uh, but plants and meiosis and plants make spores directly from meiosis. Make, so make spores directly, and they are haploid. These haploid spores can go through mitosis then to produce um, the cells for fertilization too. Uh, so plants can be a little different. Like I said, not, not too much detail about plants. Our focus here is mostly uh, humans. All right, but that's all I have for this chapter. So I will be making a video after this showing an example problems. Remember last chapter we did like the chromosome count and chromatid count at different stages. So that example one I'm making is what if I ask you 
about, you know, here is prophase one of meiosis one versus prophase two of meiosis two. What different number of chromosomes do, or sister chromatids do we have in each when talking about meiosis then as well? And that helps bring this whole chapter together in a way too. So be sure to check out that video up. It'll be posted after this one. And if you have any questions on this chapter, definitely reach out and let me know. And I hope this was like a nice little summary of some old biology you might've talked about a long time ago, or you're studying it now and you're learning it fresh. But yeah, hope you all have a great day and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.